My name is Neil Kramer. I am a British philosopher. I study mysticism, consciousness, and metaphysics is probably the quickest, easiest way of describing it. Yesterday, here, I spoke about regeneration. And what I was drawing people's attention to essentially was the idea that destruction is part of the creative process. So very often in life at the moment, people are worried about the destruction of the biosphere, destruction of relationships, destruction of health, of life, of forests, of whatever, of everything. Yeah, that's right, that's true. And my contention is that it's part of a regenerative natural process. So I was drawing people's consciousness to the concept that in order for new growth to take place, old systems have to be dissolved and destroyed. And as you saw, we talked about that on the solar system level, the planetary level, the cultural level, and also the personal level. So in our own lives and how things change and things go away, people go away and new people come and new things come. So it was really an attempt to diffuse the drama of it by shifting people's perspective, not just to continually look out of their own eyes and just see everything from a self point of view, but to consider it from a more elevated point of view to say, actually, maybe none of the going away in quotes is a bad thing. And how does like initiation or reincarnation or baptism kind of fit into that theme of regeneration? Well, it's symbolic in Christian and Western religious traditions to say, when you are baptized, you are generally regenerating yourself at a certain point in the cycle. So you are symbolically doing away with the old self and creating a new identity for worship to Christ or God or whatever. And being born again as an adult, if you were to become a, a fundamentalist Christian, you would be born again. And once again, that's a means of psychologically and spiritually demarcating the beginning of a new process in your regenerative cycle, which is largely symbolic and largely, if I may say, meaningless in the last 500 years of modern religious history. But going further back than that, there was the observance that every seven years, all human beings regenerate completely from the ground up in a very literal, manifested way, which is a wonderful thing, but you have to take advantage of it because the only thing that gets carried over is your purest, most noble, most creative, constructive, refined thoughts. So if you do nothing, if you just watch television and go to work and play the game and do your Excel spreadsheets and pick your nose, then you're not really going to take advantage of that process. Whereas your personal revelations, the universal wisdom that you come upon, you know, your nobility, your authentic conduct in life with your friends and family with life itself, those things get augmented at the seven-year regeneration point and purified, and all the nonsense gets dissolved away, as you would take a flame, the alchemist would take a flame to something in the crucible to purify, and it's the same thing. So in astrology, there is the seven-year cycle of Saturn, where you have the conjunction and then the square opposition and then another square and then the return, you know, and this kind of goes over and over. And so there is this kind of like splitting up the life into three major chunks of the early childhood, the midlife, and then the kind of elderhood. And yeah. so I'm just curious of, you know, when you were showing that chart of the every seven years, how do you kind of make sense of like, what are those kind of mileposts for every seven years? Well... The real answer to that is from my own observations initially to say that has seemed to be the case in my life if I look back at key events. Not necessarily material things, but inner events, inner growth. And also part of my work is to work with other people who engage me privately one-to-one -to, -one to counsel them in spiritual matters, you might say, or to provide guidance, to offer guidance. And they too... I keep a record of all these things, and I've noted that that's the case. In mystical literature, European mystery school traditions, that is a, a well-observed thing, but it's hard to talk about because it's initiatory information, so it's never on the exoteric published material. You won't find this stuff on bookshelves necessarily, but I think it's appropriate to share the principle of that, which is that at those seven-year increments, something happens to a person as a seven-year-old, a 14-year-old, 21, 28, 35, 42, etc., and onwards and onwards. 
And if you consider those moments in one's own life, you'll tend to find that some great theme coalesced or culminated in some meaningful event or was destroyed or some crisis bloomed, you know? So it has a practical element as well. Theory is no good to me unless I can apply it, but it does seem to apply this one. And uh, you had mentioned the, the alchemical process, and there does seem to be the process of dissolving and burning something down to its core essence. And so maybe you could talk a bit about how the alchemical process and those insights, how you take those insights and then feed them back into the process of regeneration and transformation. Well, it is a matter of will. It's not a mental operation, which is where most people fail on this one, understandably, quite honestly. So in the West, we taught that, you know, if you go and see a psychologist or a therapist or a psychiatrist or whatever, either for academic tuition or for personal help or whatever, you'll be taught mental tricks to try and make yourself feel okay. And you will be given mental instructions to say, you know, you are good, you are worthy, that's not your fault, don't take it personally, and so on. And, and while that can have an intellectual impact to say, well, hmm, yeah, you know, that helps. I hadn't considered that. The actual transformation bit does not occur in the mind, and it does not occur either in the heart. I have to say it occurs in the will, which, as our Hindu friend suggested, is kind of located at the solar plexus. So there is this third element of perception and processing which is largely ignored in the West and indeed in the East. And it is a very esoteric thing, which is will. And will is an emanation in my mystical philosophy of divinity. And our nearest analog to that is the star in our system, the sun. And that sun lends itself to each will in each individual through an emanation, through a light emanation. And that very literally acts as an inner fire, which you come across this terminology a lot in European literature of the last 2,000 years, the inner fire. And that inner fire is the only thing that has the power to dissolve, to transmute, to break down what the mind is in no position to break down. The mind is something that can conceive and can calculate and articulate very, very well, but it can't actually break down something. If you've got a sorrow or a grief or a loss or a joy or a bliss, it's not in a position to do anything about that. All it can do is endlessly analyze it and provide data on it and perspectives on it. The will, however, can physically change that energetic pattern. And so what is the process of cultivating one's will? How do you sort of uh, take these energies and actually put it into the world? What does that process look like? That is a process that requires probably about 10 years training and a lot of esoteric study. I am doing a workshop on it in September here, actually, called Alchemy of Will. I know it's a bit of an advert, but you see that poster there. So that has been an increasingly potent thing in my life that has made a difference, so much so that people like me who have been mystical students of various schools and systems in the past are deciding to take those principles out of an initiated few and share it with others. Not in a way that, you know, the, the secret brotherhood is going to come after me and stab me at night as I lie in bed, but to share a principle of something that somebody then has to go away and unpack on their own. So the old, what today spiritual people call ascended masters, as Castaneda called them, the sorcerers of antiquity, they would respectfully answer a question like that by giving a seed to a person and saying you need to go away with that and care for that seed and germinate it and then as it starts to bloom you'll need to look after that plant and if you don't then you're not in any position to handle this information so zen masters used to do it you know they'd say where is buddha and they go this is my shoe and you think, well, you know, that's not a very good, what the hell does that mean? But that's a seed, that's a koan seed. And somebody will go away with that, and it may take them 10 years to understand the import of that, right? And similarly, with Western esoteric traditions, one gets used to respectfully dealing in these things, because you're always talking to people at all different levels. You don't want to fool anybody. We're not trying to puzzle people. We're not trying to fudge the issue. But what you have to be careful of, and this is what we have initiation for, is that you don't give somebody 
like you would give a child the ability to create fire too soon because then you get into all kinds of trouble and people hurt themselves. So what you're doing is you're dealing with, first of all, principles, and then you're transmitting inner knowledge about that, that people are then fully able, if they so wish, with the right discipline to go away and do something with that. So I would say that in contemplating the relationship between our star here in our solar system and ourselves and our will, you can begin to formulate an idea of what that might actually be. You can then go and look in some of the, what I would call modern literature, like the Nag Hammadi Coptic Gnostic texts, and see how they talk about divinity and light. Because we often see, you know, if you grew up in a, a normal American or British household, the light of God, you just think, yeah, yeah, you know, what does that mean? And then you think light is some sort of spiritual allegory for knowledge or enlightenment. Very often it means light, literally light. And so when you bring light into your soul, you are literally bringing light into your soul. And then this leads to a, a contemplation or a study or an analysis of the sun. And when you look at the sun, you realize that it isn't this giant solar nuclear reactor, just a big fireball in space. It's not that at all. It's something quite different, but it's so scientifically heretical to talk in that way. And in mainstream culture, you would be looked upon as a fool if you suggested that the sun wasn't hot, for instance, which I don't believe it is. And so it absolutely challenges the most fundamental thing, which is the thing that sustains this planet isn't doing it quite in the way that we thought it was, and it isn't what we think it is. So the nature of being of the sun is where you'll get your answer to that question. And one of the things that you had mentioned is that with all the planets, you know, the closer you get to the sun, the higher frequencies there are. And so we're kind of like, you know, there's the sun, Mercury, Venus, and Earth and Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And so all the way out to Pluto is like the most dense, and then the Earth is like relatively close to the Sun, so we have a little bit higher frequencies. And then with Venus and Mercury, is even higher. And then when you get to the Sun, I guess it's the highest frequency. Maybe you could, you know, how did you come up into this cosmology, and, and what are you doing with that sort of insight? Once again, it, that is an old ancient world philosophy that comes from a time that we've now have no records of. People like Helena Blavatsky formulated some of this into theosophy, which was popular in Europe and North America sort of 150 years ago. Still popular today, there is a theosophical society in Portland, Oregon, for example, quite a good one. And theosophists consider things rather in this manner, not quite like that. But it's actually Rosicrucianism who will just lay it out like that and say, okay, there's this shift from race to race, from planet to planet, from form to form. So it's not like Star Trek where everything is humanoid. You know, you've got Vulcans and humans and Borg or whatever, and they're all essentially physical. That is done away with altogether. The physical stops at Earth. And after that, it changes. And even before that, like Neptune and stuff, it's not a physical life. So physicality is a very sacred lesson because to be stuffed into our beefy vessel, as I called it yesterday, is a hell of a thing because it is inherently full of suffering, as Buddha quite rightfully pointed out. There's no escaping that. And yet there are moments of great beauty and catharsis and revelation that cannot exist without incarnating into mortal vulnerable form so being on earth is one of the most amazing parts of the journey and the rosicrucian scholars would say that the next part of the journey is to refine that body to the extent where you can transfer that consciousness to a more ethereal body for its transit to venus which is you know a very fascinating idea because you know, you go to an astronomer and talk about Venus and say, oh, well, that's impossible because of it. it's this and it's this and the atmosphere and the heat and the gas formation and all these things. And you think, well, yeah, we're not talking about transporting monkeys with spacesuits on there to try and build a biodome, though. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an environment that is perfectly, sublimely suited to that next phase of development, which is a higher refinement of consciousness and a more consistent, coherent, 
life emanation from soul. Whereas here, our cohesion with our soul energy is very inconsistent, very irregular. We don't really know what the hell's going on. And we have intermittent contact with our soul, as you might say. You have to work very hard to get a consistent phone line to that. You know, it's kind of like a bad cell phone line where you can barely make out. You just think, oh, this is stupid. I can't, I just cannot, I can't. And you, so you turn it off, you know, we get used to turning it off. As you get closer to the center, closer to light, that changes your bandwidth and your historical memory, or you might want to romantically say, you know, your soul memory, your tribal memory, whatever you want to call it. But your own lineage back through many incarnations is more readily accessed. So your own store of knowledge and your own sense of history, your own personal conscious trajectory really, really gives a a focus to what you're doing, which we lack here. We're kind of on our own and keep forgetting all the time, which is the game of time. That's okay. That's what we're supposed to do, be separated. But as you move closer to light, the union is retained, which gives us a great sense of relief, first and foremost, and strength and confidence. So there are modern theosophical and Rosicrucian tenets for this, and you can examine that in um, the Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception, which is a book that goes into that. It's, it's kind of controversial because they say some rather debatable things about race and ethnicity and whatnot that today don't go down too well. But if you can overlook that and see that that's a product of a certain mode of thinking from a certain era, the principles behind what the guy's saying in it, Max Heindel, I think it is, off the top of my head, I can't remember, are good. And there's some fascinating stuff about planetary evolution, which has been, as with theosophy, collated from a lot of sources where, you know, pretty decent scholars have distilled stuff, thrown out things that are rubbish and said, no, this is good. This Hindu thing's good. This Hindu thing's rubbish. This Chinese thing, yeah, that's okay. This German thing, that's good. And they've synthesized this syncretic mystical approach, which I think is quite good. Mm. And you had mentioned suffering, and it seems like in the face of suffering and trauma, we turn to creation stories and creation myths to get to the question of, like, who are we and why are we here? And so in your journeys, how have you come to an answer to that question? I haven't, but I keep approaching it from different angles that add a bit more to it. If somebody, would, I often say, if somebody were to hold a gun to your head and say, that's not good enough, you can't say that, give me an answer or I'll pull the trigger. I'd say, okay, why are we here to learn? You know, where did we come from? The divine. Where are we going? The divine. So for me, the old idea that I heard when I was like 19, that God cuts a little piece of himself off, sends it out into the universe and says, go and check that out. And if you can, it would be good if you contribute to that creation as well and then come back home is as good a story as any. And as you get to the furthest outreaches, you forget what the hell you're doing. You forget where you're from and you think you're on your own and you're just this little guy, Kent, with all your problems or whatever. And you, you have no idea. And that's part of the joy of the journey because you're witnessing at that extent of emanation. is so pure and is so sincere. It's priceless to bring home because he can't see that. You can, he can't. But when you bring it home, then it goes back to the whole. That's apocatastasis I spoke about yesterday, the restitution of everything in the end. So that would be my personal rough sketch at the moment. And it seems from my studies of esoteric knowledge, there seems to be an important role of the subconscious of intention of using symbolic archetypes to be able to tap into things that are beyond the mind. And so maybe you could talk a bit about how those all kind of play into the process of manifestation. Well, human beings like stories, don't they? So they like myths and narratives and scripts and actors and players and all that. So for me, I mean, when you come to a conference or an event or when you go around, you know, the bookstores, you're in Portland, right? You go to Powell's and there's great sections, isn't there, on new age and spirituality, philosophy, you know, Hebrew mysticism, all kinds of wonderful, interesting things. And there's all these gods and names and stories and things. And it's like, People find it difficult to abstract, so they need to pin it on a god or a person or a process or mercury or sulfur or yellow or orange or something like that. And they like 
the symbols that we use to resonate a certain kind of energy. And what I have found is that the more you start to move away from culture, human mainstream synthetic culture, the culture of normal people, normal world, normal media, the more able you are to naturally abstract, where you don't need to pin it on gods and stories and Christs and Mother Marys and aliens and stuff like that. There's not a necessity for that. And the closer you get to source and the closer you get to truth, the less necessary it is for us to tell stories anymore. But we find that very uncomfortable. We can't understand how it could be without stories. But as you get closer to truth, what is happening is energy is purifying and refining. So you hear people talk about, you know, the seventh dimension and the 15th dimension. What a load of nonsense. As soon as you move out of the fourth dimension, we are in a land of no conception. We can't even begin to perceive it. So I think what people are meaning is higher levels of more refined levels of manifestation. And we systemize that and say there's like, you know, 11 dimensions, 23 dimensions and all that. It's just a manner of speaking that. To me, it's arbitrary that, all arbitrary. Nobody has any conception whatsoever of that. And the most extreme human beings that I've met in the last 40 years who've really pushed out into the furthest realms and say, I cannot perceive because I cannot conceive. So when your conception stops, your perception stops. So to conceive of the majesty of creation embodied in beings is silly. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't take long before the whole idea of narratives ceases. And so we have to get past that. And one way to do it is to start to reduce your reliance on culture, on cultural narratives, on music and literature and television and radio and print and, you know, things that can bring us pleasure and can show us lovely things about the world from time to time, but essentially keep us anchored in the 3D, in the world of stories. I don't think that's fundamentally helpful in the end. So I, I am very much, the purer you can get, the better. And sometimes it's nice to tell stories. And you've probably heard me telling a few while I've been here. Yes, and that's something we do to communicate. But personally, in our inner reflections, it's not necessary. And so some of my profound experiences in other realms, if I can say it like that, are not possible to articulate that they're non-communicable and that's how it is that's exactly how it is and in the furthest reaches of some entheogen induced voyage people will say it's state specific which means it can only be described using syntax and language that exists there not here we can't put it into the rudiments of english you need to use these like fourth dimensional geometry that only exists there you can't bring that back to describe it here. So the whole way it's set up, there's no up and down, there's no left and right, there's no plants, there's no separate beings, there's no stars, there's none of that. So to begin to describe it, you have to go to the nearest reference point, which is what humans do, we use symbolism. So it's kind of a long way around, but that's my feelings on it. Yeah, you'd, yesterday you had mentioned that there was the three-dimensional reality which we all exist in, but then you know if you use your combination of your mind and your heart and your will, that you can have some access of perceiving this realm of the fourth dimension. Maybe you could talk a bit about how you understand this fourth dimension and maybe some of the experiences that you've had that have given you some sort of confirmation or synchronicity-induced type of validity for your own knowing about this realm. Well, with the idea of apocatastasis, this idea that we tend to associate with this Greek guy from 184 called Origin, he said that everything goes out, kind of wiggles around and then comes back again. So it's all coming backwards into harmonic perfection, which culminates in God himself, right? Which is kind of like a nice idea because we always think of it the opposite way around. Like something magical happened and it's all now drifting away into bizarre nothingness, you know? It's the other way around. So there was bizarre nothingness and it's all drifting into magnificent wholeness. And there's a part on that journey that we call the fourth dimension or the fourth density is probably a better way of describing it. But dimension helps us because we do think in terms of spatial dimensions, not densities, don't we? So we'll call it a dimension. That dimension is a place on that homeward journey. It's a stage of that journey. 
Like you might say, well, it's the North American leg of our world tour. The fourth dimension is part of a journey. And in that part of the journey, the coalescence of things has reached a certain harmony and synchronicity where more magic is possible and more endurance of consciousness and more penetration of consciousness is possible. And it's what we call the magical world, the realm of wizards and elves and pixies, if you were to put it in that language. It's the realm of light beings. It's the realm of mythological beings. It used to be something that was very evident because it takes a long time, this thing. It used to be very evident here, but um, when you slow down consciousness, you can't see it. So, you know, people talk about raising the frequency or whatever. Just think of it as velocity instead. If your consciousness accelerates, it can do more and see more. So a way of thinking about the 4D is it's like an overlay over the top of this. So we were talking yesterday about nature spirits and English folklore where you have spriggans and sprites and stuff and piskies protecting stone circles, long barrows and hills and whatnot. What they're really saying is there's a kind of light being that's in the fourth density that regards this place and is looking after it. But how it chooses to manifest in the 3D is authored by human consciousness largely, which the being may choose to adopt just for its own amusement. So we determine what a pixie is more than the pixie itself, if you get my drift. So like a light being is absolutely not in need of any form or a little yellow checkered waistcoat and red pointy shoes. You know, there's no requirement for that in the fourth density, but neither is the requirement for you to wear your shoes or me mine. It's something we choose to do. And so they do. So if you went to a conference that was all very posh and you were on television, they might say, Kent, you need to put a bloody shirt and tie on your scruffy bastard. And you'd say, oh, right, well, okay, you know, if that's what it takes, because it's not really, we're not bothered about that. Similarly, they may say, well, here we are in Ireland and we have this thing of leprechauns or whatever. Let's pander to that stereotype and that mythos because it actually means something and people can perceive it. And if we do manifest in that form, rural communities won't fear us. They'll consider us as part, like little humans, you know? So it's a way of, entities from that realm interacting with humans without scaring the you know what out of them so there's definitely that there and as i said yesterday as well because of mainstream modern culture and that all through our lives and probably our parents television has been omnipresent in our existence and that in structure on what is real and what isn't real and how to think and now in your generation i would say that's been sort of replaced by the internet really but it's still doing the same thing, essentially. So the primary means of in, an interaction with a fourth density space or fourth density beings is to unlearn, is to empty your cup, as it were, as Bruce Lee used to say. It doesn't matter what you want to put in, how good it is. If it's full, it's full. So emptying oneself out is the foundational step to doing it. The quick and dirty route to it is plant medicine, you know, is to put some... DMT in yourself and say, well, this will show you the mechanism, right? But it's like the wheel of fortune. You spin in that and you don't know where quite it's going to land. And sometimes you have a cathartic, amazing epiphany and sometimes you get your ass kicked, you know? So it's not self-directed quite in that way, although the Banisteriopsis carpi vine will do its best to be therapeutic with us or the active components of ketamine will do its best to show us what it's like to live without an ego for example but it is very crude to think that these things are the way to do it it's a very crude way of thinking and it's very injurious to the development of the mind and the soul refinement as a human to become reliant on medicine just as it would be to become reliant on headache pills or prescription drugs or whatever people can get into a lot of trouble doing that I don't see it as any different. So the plant medicine is just that. It's medicine to show you something or to boot part of your system that has forgotten how to function. So if your liver is underperforming or you've got a lung infection, you would take a substance that helps to get that back on track with something like DMT molecule, as it were, that is going to say, well, 
here's something you can do where you release a certain gateway in your brain where you have a purer experience of what you're actually seeing. So you're not going anywhere. You're not raising anything. You're not actually doing anything. You're stopping doing something when you examine the 4D. You're stopping your cultural engine from running. You're turning it off. But that is almost impossible to do. I've met people who've done meditation for 70 years. They can't, still can't do it. And then you can put a plant in your mouth and you've got eight hours of it or 15 minutes of it, your choice. But that's to show you how to do it. And so one has to be very obviously careful about talking about these things. You know, your recording is going to be downloaded and we don't know who's going to listen. They might rush out and throw some drugs down the neck and do something unwise. I'm expecting that we're talking to a smarter audience than that, a wiser kind of class of person who appreciates that culture tells human beings what to do. And it says, this is so exciting that this is all you need. And that has been the blight of man for the last hundred years, in my view. And obviously prior to that, the print media and and magazines and so on. And that has to stop. So 10 years ago, it was unusual for someone not to have a television in our business, wasn't it? Now it's not. Most people aren't watching cable television very often. And most of them don't have live broadcast television. That started to change. And there's a distinct diversion happening, I think now where most people find it unusual to consider sitting down on a sofa for six hours every night watching a screen. I don't think people are doing that anymore. So that's the first step to a better, more natural interaction with the 4D. And finally, maybe you could tell me a bit about your book, Unfoldment, and what you were trying to communicate there. Yes. The Unfoldment, my book from 2012, is my experiment to say, okay, This is a book that anybody can pick up and you can give it to your friends, family, your mum and dad, your nephew, anybody who can read, right? And who is vaguely interested in the world and some of its mysteries. This is a book that's safe to give to people that will respect those people without patronizing them, without disrespecting them. I intend to write three books and this is book one, which is this is a book for everybody. And in it, I have placed and coded some very deep and revelatory philosophy, in my view, which will put people on a track of growth and strength and truth and lead to a more satisfying life. And I truly mean that. As we go into the future, that will change. But even for the old hands, people who have been doing this longer than I have, they've been very appreciative and said I very much enjoyed reading The Unfoldment and it is packed with gems, some out there in your face, some hidden, which is true. I'm kind of like mischievous like that. So yeah, I would encourage anyone to check it out, read a few pages online. I think you can do that these days and then please pick it up, take it home, read it, enjoy it. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. I enjoyed it. Thank you.